Okay, so welcome back um, to our virtual room. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Pier Vittorio uh, Aurelli. I'm the director of the um, PhD program at the Architecture Association. And uh, I'm welcoming you to the afternoon session of our uh, symposium, um, uh, which actually focus on the politics of construction. God is in the detail, labor architecture and the politics of construction. Uh, it's a symposium that, uh, as I just mentioned in the, in the morning, uh, follow up another one that we organized five years ago on labor and architecture. Uh, and at the end of that symposium, we realized that uh, a big uh, uh, important side of labor, uh, of course, vis-a-vis uh, -vis to architecture is construction and not just uh, design. And in fact, the construction of architecture, funnily enough, has always been a very blind spot uh, in the work uh, uh, and education of architects, especially in recent uh, uh, times, uh, for many reasons that we have also discussed in the morning, uh, uh, morning session. So in a way, this symposium is a kind of pedagogical experiment uh, to reopen up the issue of construction and building uh, as a, a fundamental side, not only actually of uh, design, but also of uh, theory, of architectural theory, and especially as a side to repoliticize uh, architecture, or let's say the production of, uh, uh, of architecture. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, opening uh, statements of this symposium was that uh, uh, construction and building are also a blind spot uh, uh, of, of critical theory. I mean, we often discuss ideas, uh, uh, ideologies, uh, uh, large, uh, let's say, uh, social and cultural framework. What often remain unseen uh, is really the, mo the materialization of architecture, the labor that goes in it, not just actually the technicalities. Uh. So we want to actually reclaim uh, the, the uh, building and construction away from the technical aspects, uh, but without actually abandoning them, but trying to see how they have been historically, um, in a way, designed in order to uh, organize uh, the uh, labor of construction and in order for architecture to be uh, an apparatus of control and also of extraction of, uh, of surplus value. Um, so uh, this afternoon, in the morning, actually, we have seen how this process in a way already starts in antiquity. Um, we have seen how already in ancient Roman architecture, the building industry was really a vast apparatus of welfare, but also consumption and, and control, let's say, of the population. Um, we have seen also how historically there have been attempts by architects themselves to break through this condition with Architectura Nova, uh, which was presented by uh, Davide uh, Sacconi. Uh, and then we have seen actually how iconic projects uh, of modern architecture, such as the Crystal Palace, uh, uh, were in, indeed uh, not just uh, building on their own right, but really machines that were meant to uh, the skill uh, the labor of workers. In fact, this the skilling uh, the labor of workers seems to be one of the fundamental, let's say, project uh, of, uh, of of construction in the in especially in, in modernity and design. Especially has been very much geared. Uh, often without even architects really being aware of that, uh, being very much geared to produce this uh, condition. Um, and of course, finally, we have seen uh, a very uh, interesting presentation by Cathy Lloyd uh, Thomas about building specifications and how uh, products uh, uh, became extremely uh, ubiquitous, available already in, in the 1930s, uh, how these building products were proliferating, especially for the sake of consumption, that targeted women, especially as the, uh, let's say, caretakers uh, of this new emerging market of building uh, materials, and how architecture actually also, the architecture of the welfare state was very much geared towards this uh, uh, mechanism uh, uh, and apparatuses of, of control and production. So in a way, the picture that we have trying to sketch uh, uh, in the morning is uh, very complex, but also clear in arguing how um, building architecture 
is uh, certainly not about building shelters for inhabitation, but uh, it's really devising an industry uh, for both production consumption and of course extraction of surplus value. Now we will open the afternoon uh, with uh, uh, two uh, presentations on two architects that somehow have tried to also react uh, to this condition in very different ways uh, and with very different projects. Uh, so the first uh, presentation will be delivered by uh, Hugh uh, Strange, uh, who is actually um, the um, founder of Strange Architects, uh, a very interesting practice, uh, London-based uh, practice uh, that uh, very much deals with, I mean, that has made really the, the process of construction a very important chapter, in, let's say, in their approach to architecture. But actually, what is interesting that uh, you, while practicing architecture, he's also pursuing a PhD uh, dissertation at the School of Architecture, uh, the University of Oslo. And his thesis actually really investigate the work of architects such as William Lethaby uh, and uh, Walter Siegel, for example, but also other practices that have really tried to uh, break through the separation, the division of labor in between design and, and construction. And this afternoon, he will introduce us to the work of Walter Siegel, one of the most uh, interesting uh, uh, architects, uh, not, I mean, maybe very well known uh, in uh, UK, but not so much well known, I might be wrong, uh, outside uh, UK, uh, who actually uh, really developed a method uh, which later was known as the Siegel uh, uh, method. And you actually has started a very interesting close reading of uh, Walter Siegel uh, approach. And I'm very happy that uh, he will be able to share his findings and his research uh, with us uh, this afternoon. So thank you, uh, Yug, and uh, well, the virtual floor uh, is yours. Thank you. Thank you, um, Pierre Victoria, for the invitation. Um, thank you for the uh, talks this morning, which I thought there were many uh, parallels uh, with uh, my research, in particular, um, Katie Lloyd Thomas's um, research into the rise of building products and her description of the role of architects as gatekeepers, which I think um, maybe we come back to after my talk at some point. I thought that was a very interesting parallel. Um, I also wanted to thank, uh, in relation to my research, two people who are present here, um, Phil Christou and John C. Uh, John Broom, who are in the audience. And John Broom was uh, Siegel's assistant on the um, later Lewisham projects. Great. Um, in 1963, Walter Siegel was faced with a dual dilemma. Uh, uh, in the broadest sense, he felt he'd been engaged in what he described as a 30-year war with traditional processes of getting buildings built. Uh, by this, he meant struggles with bureaucracy, what he referred to as control apparatus, with traditional masonry construction, with a system of contractors and contracting. Writing later, I built 30 houses in London before 1962, but it was becoming really warfare. I found it harder and harder, and I longed to get out. I would suggest that these frustrations might be understood as being with the imposed distances between architects, clients, and builders. But he also faced an immediate problem. He was building a new home for himself in brick construction at the bottom of the page, and this involved the demolition of their existing house. And so he needed to house his family for the duration of the building works. He did this by building a temporary structure to the rear, later known as the little house in the garden. Significantly, the budget for the temporary house was to come from the budget for the main house, and the structure only had a temporary planning permission. And so Siegel sought to build a cheap, quick and demountable building. He also hoped that through the specific manner in which it was demountable, he could recoup some of the costs uh, of the materials through resale. The house plan was very compact with a central living room with the various other rooms around it, almost uh, covered in courtyard. And it was built with a lightweight timber frame with a post sitting on concrete paving slabs, unfixed and with no foundations below at all. The walls were clad in mineral felt 
with visible fixing battens. And the felt roof was not fixed to the substrate, simply weighed down by loose laid bricks and one and a half inches of water that Siegel would top up with a hose when the water evaporated. The structure was erected in only 10 weeks and cost approximately one tenth the price of the main house per square meter. The house was published in the architectural press in 1966, but in the same year, it was also in the mainstream press. Articles like this one in the Financial Times focused on the remarkable low cost of the project and quickly led to a demand for similar houses from private clients. Over the next few years, and in particular from 1968 to 72, Siegel completed a number of private houses in timber frame construction all of them for extremely low budgets and completed within very short programs. This image shows one of the first projects, Bally Garrett House in Ireland, completed in 1968 and built in three weeks in a three-week holiday with a client working alongside a carpenter. This is perhaps the last of his houses with the uh, mineral felt walling. And this image shows the Collier House, or the Tree House, as it was also known, in Halstead from 1969. Here, asbestos panels, available in a variety of colours, have replaced the felt walling from the earlier houses. And this house in Sussex from 1970 introduces an oversailing roof for the first time. And this playroom in Wembley from 1970 was also completed in three weeks. As these projects developed, a number of details varied from the little house in the garden. You can see in this typical detail section from uh, one of the later projects, the introduction of pebbles to the roof in lieu of the water and bricks, the overhanging roof uh, rather than the flush profile of the Highgate project, the change in wall cladding from felt to asbestos or fibre cement panels, and small concrete footings added as foundations. However, the key principles of these buildings were established at the Highgate House and developed and refined in this series of private commissions, developing into what was later characterized as the Siegel Method. Uh, key to the constructural logic of these buildings is the use of off-the-shelf materials. These elements were readily available and mass-produced. Siegel writing later, my main idea has been to use materials in their market sizes fitted to a framework. The schedule of seagulls lists the key sheet materials they use in the houses, along with their dimensions. You see in the, uh, you see the various wood wool slabs, glass or sheets, plaster boards for micas on, and the width of them is a standard two foot or four foot. And uh, significantly the wood wool slabs have a thickness of two inches. We'll come back to that. In part, Siegel was encountering a level of dimensional coordination that already existed in the industry, but he was also selecting specific materials for their dimensional compatibility. Writing later, uh, right at the time, I slithered into the discovery, shamefully late, that a market of mass produced materials does exist and that by and large, there are many materials that are dimensionally coordinated, which you only have to buy and assemble. Significantly, Siegel was not designing a system or attempting to invent, design or standardize a production process. He was not designing components or joints that would be manufactured. Instead, he was observing the coordination that already existed in the industrial production uh, and, and was available within the open market and was seeking to best utilize, combine and assemble these ready-made building products. These materials were fitted into a timber post and beam structure with minimal on-site alteration, which meant as few cuts as possible, as little change to the finish and appearance as possible, and only using dry jointing. And the frame was therefore dimensioned according to the standard available materials, the wood wool slabs being particularly significant here. This key wall detail demonstrates the overall constructural logic of Siegel's method. The wood wall slabs comes in two foot by two inch uh, dimensions or 600 by 50 millimeters. So all the walls are this thick and of lengths that are a factor of the number of panels. The panels are spaced 
50 millimeters apart. You see the 50 by 50 block as a spacer here, which allows cross walls where necessary. And after linings are applied either side of the wood wall slab, which are also minimally altered, the timber battens are bolted tight to secure the wall build up. So the wall is held without glue or screws just by pressure and uh, friction. So the detail suggests the dimensional arrangement. It suggests an elimination of unnecessary alterations and a manner of connection that is both flexible and adaptable. And this detail leads to a basic tartan grid with two foot by two inch spacing, later 650, 600 millimeters and 50 millimeters, on which all the house plans were based. So the detail leads to the grid and the grid, uh, together with the construction logic of the method, in turn leads to house plans such as this. And this is an example from Lewisham phase one, where the walls are drawn as a series of two foot, two inch slabs. And the other elements, such as windows, doors, stairs, are simply coordinated accordingly. The logic continues through all the details. So the doors, for instance, largely fit into the grid with 600 millimeter wide single doors or 1200 millimeter wide double doors. And pursuing the logic of dry fit, the roofing felt edge is clamped tight, but the roof is neither bonded to the substrate or screw fixed or bonded at the edges, allowing thermal movement. <coughs> the emission of wet trades in these projects and the reduction in secondary alteration materials transform the nature of on-site work towards a process of assembly. This, together with the reduction in the number of trades involved, led to a rigorous simplification of the building process. Uh, this is a list of these early projects after his own house, where you see the labor force, uh, which is in many cases, one carpenter only, sometimes two, sometimes one carpenter working with, with the client. In these private commissions, Siegel was thus able to manage the uh, projects without a main contractor, a carpenter doing the majority of the works, sometimes assisted by a client, and also with electricians, plumbers, and roofers contributing where necessary. Eventually, and perhaps inevitably, a client observing the remarkable simplicity of the building process decided to take on the project's construction themselves. The clients here for the Holland House in Suffolk were a pair of young teachers who had seen a Siegel House published in the mainstream press. As with pre Siegel's previous clients, the Hollands have been closely involved in the design process and operating within the logic of the method, Siegel gave them space to decide the layout, the cladding, the color, so on, amongst other things. In Siegel's telling, after observing the carpenters on the first day of site works, the client called Siegel and said the men weren't required anymore, and that they themselves could complete the works. This is the um, two uh, teachers on site. In parallel to the simplification of construction and building process, Siegel's own working method also undertook a process of simplification that reinforced his own independence. Apart from periods at the beginning and end of his career, he worked alone without assistance. He worked without structural engineers doing all his own calculations. This is a page of structural calculations for the Holland House. And he also worked without quantity surveyors doing all his own schedules. And by the time Siegel had, by this time Siegel had also simplified his drawings and information to build from. For each project, there was a set of specific A4 freehand drawings. He'd freed himself from uh, the set square and the hard line. These are the Holland House drawings with site plan, plan, elevations. Uh, and there was a slightly later extension added. Uh, and then there was a specific schedule of materials. This he uh, completed in his role as a, as kind of uh, taking over QS's roles. So uh, this is uh, pages from the Holland House schedule with drawings complementing the schedule as necessary. But he also, as well as these specific uh, types of information, he also had a generic set of information applicable to all projects. So this comprised a 20-page catalogue of elements 
that is a standard set of details. This is a sample page showing all the possible wall configurations. And there was also a nine page sequence of erection and assembly, a written document that describes the process of construction step by step. As his private clients took on ever greater proportions of the construction work themselves, Siegel saw the methods potential for self-build and was keen to apply this to social housing schemes. Around this time, Siegel's contemporaries and colleagues, writers like John Turner, the author of Freedom to Build, and Siegel's friendly anarchist Colin Ward, were suggesting greater dweller control within housing provision as an alternative to top-down solutions. Eventually, through Colin Ward and the deputy borough architect Brian Richardson, amongst others, an opportunity arose in the London borough of Lewisham. The council was to provide the land, the government, the money for materials and self-builders the labour. On completion, the houses were tra transferred to a shared ownership scheme where the self-builders owned 50% through a council-backed mortgage and 50% was paid as rent to the council. In this first phase, Four sites were selected for 14 houses, all the sites steeply sloping and deemed unsuitable for standard housing solutions. The majority of these houses were single story as the previous private, previous private houses, but there were also two story houses introduced at this stage. This is the site in Bromley for two houses. Uh, one of these was the first to be completed in 10 months. Uh, this was the largest site in Forest Hills, seven single story houses in what was to become Seagull Close. Uh, there's a shared communal parking area at the front, which allows the house to be accessed from a shared lane. And here, two sites close to each other in Sydenham uh, for five houses, uh, including here two paired two story houses. Um, and the design for these, uh, this pair of houses was uh, uh, fairly typical, very compact, very efficient, and the houses always detached to allow the self-builders to construct their houses at their own speeds, uh, independent from their neighbours. The roof plan of one of these houses is determined by regular layout of the wood wall slabs. The timber frame below, and the foundations below that are both determined by the tartan grid of 600 by 50 millimeters. And in section, the timber bracing in the center of the structure is revealed. Um, the, this works in compression rather than tension. And the elevations uh, that are generated uh, uh, by a combination of the frame, the batten cover detail, the grid dimensions, together with the layout of rooms, all producing a result that seems self-evident from the method, with the cover batten detail determining the distinctive visual appearance of both the interiors and the exteriors of the houses. Following the completion of the first scheme in the early 80s, a second scheme was developed in Honor Oak Park in what was to become Walter's Way for 13 two-story houses. In contrast to the variety of house types in the first phase, where eight types in total were used between 14 houses, here the strategy was to have a standardized ha uh, size, frame and core with a variety of layouts within the constraints of this 80 meter squared plan structure. This is the um, pencil drawings for plot two uh, variant of one of these houses. The initial opportunity for the first phase of projects was advertised in the local council newspaper, Outlook, with an invitation for people on the council's waiting list, and self-builders were chosen by ballot following a public meeting in 1976. Construction finally started in March 1979, and residents combined construction with their working lives, building during evenings, weekends and holidays. All members of the families were encouraged to be involved. Communal work, such as the drain runs and raising frames, were shared on an ad hoc basis. After the frames were erected, the roofs were constructed, providing a covered working space for the remainder of the build. Siegel was joined 
for the Lewisham project by John Broom, who's with us, uh, who became Siegel's assistant, but also one of the self-builders in Siegel Close. Siegel and Broom worked closely with the self-builders on the house design, suggesting multiple layout options, but also encouraging them to draw their own configurations. Here's a house plan drawn by one of the phase two self-builders on squared paper provided by the architect. Siegel later described the process as not only providing guidance for others to follow, but having some kind of contact with each other where you decided things jointly. The drawn and written information followed the pattern established by the private houses and was very much oriented towards clear sequential on-site instructions. But Siegel and Broom also gave a series of evening classes for the self-builders at the local adult evening institute, teaching basic skills and the use of small power tool, power, small power tools that would be needed. Significantly, these were not lessons in general building skills, uh, which would have taken much longer, but just in the essentials required for this fundamentally simple method. It's noteworthy, however, that the self-builders to a large extent learn from each other on site rather than from the architect's given, architect given drawings and instructions. Siegel wrote later, this whole experience has taught me perfect, personally an awful lot about human beings. It has taught me an awful lot about the ability which, provided the methods of construction are not overbearing, can be brought to the fore, and where people can discover in themselves all kinds of talents which in their former lives they had no opportunity to use. The self-builders met regularly at local pubs and community centres in the evenings, working independently on their own, own houses, but also as a group for the many shared endeavours. And much of the material could be bulk brought together. It's the shared order list for the phase two wood wall slabs, all 600 millimetres and 50 millimetre depths, but a variety of standard lengths. And this is the shared order list for the glassal external cladding, uh, glassal external cladding sheets. Standard widths six, um, and two standard lengths, but a variety of colors chosen by each self-builder rather than seal. Siegel's method was predicated on assembling materials in their market sizes, and as such had a certain vulnerability to changes in the market. For instance, this letter from the suppliers, uh, Crawley Timber, uh, notifies the self-builders that British gypsum had changed the dimensions of its standard boards. However, by and large, there was a tolerance provided within the construction logic. Returning again to this key detail junction, we see how the gap between the wood wall uh, slabs and the timber battens is indicative of this. Though drawn aligned, the wood wall uh, and the uh, internal and external uh, cladding, there's a space here which provides a certain amount of possible overlap and tolerance between the various line, aligning uh, materials. These photos taken in the last month show the schemes as they are now. The distinctive country lane urbanism of Siegel Close. The elegant house built by John Broom there. And the vibrant community at Walters Way. The independence and freedom that Siegel sought in his own working methodologies, where he tried as much as possible to take control of his own circumstances, became evident in the manner he assisted others to control their circumstances, in the broad sense of becoming producers rather than consumers, but also in the very specific sense of seeking demystification of construction as a form of empowerment. After Siegel's death in 1985 and before the completion of Walter's Way, Colin Ward wrote, the most impressive thing about Walter Siegel was not his wonderfully simple and logical building system. It was the way that step by step in the last 30 years of his practice, he moved to a position which blurs the distinction between architect, builder and client. They aren't at the three corners of a triangular relationship, but are all mixed up in the middle of the adventure of building. 
How else, he would ask me teasingly, can you imagine that an anarchist society would work? While I agree uh, with Ward that the key significance of Siegel's work was bringing architect, client, and builder into a closer relationship, I would differ slightly in not setting this achievement apart from the rigorous simplification of building process inherent in the method, but would say instead that it was very much dependent on it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Yug, uh, uh, for this uh, amazing uh, presentation and uh, that, that really do justice to the work of uh, Walter Siegel because uh, often uh, is, uh, of course, the idea of self-building uh, can also be easily uh, romanticized. And I think you, you really presented uh, uh, his work really as a, as a project, but not a project uh, meant to somehow subordinates uh, the labor, but really as a project of self-valorization of the, of the construction process and, and those who involve in the, in the process. So I think it was a very, very significant contribution to our discussion. Is there any uh, quick uh, one or two questions to Yuga before we move to the next presentation? Yes, yeah, so you can I ask you a quick question? Especially yes, Federico. Federico, Federico yes. Um, can you just maybe really briefly talk about the the what's the labor associated with the maintenance of the system, right? That condition as part of, of the ongoing labor of, of that process? Um <clears throat> well, um I think um Apart from the theoretical labor, I think the I think the specific experience of the builders is that they um, they moved in as soon as possible. So quite often they moved in when the houses were um, habitable rather than finished. And as such, I think the idea of maintenance and completion was slightly blurred. And many of them, as 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 far as I could tell, spent years. Uh, <laughs> Um, in continuing adjustment and works, but also actually the the um, one of the great strengths of the method is the adaptability of the um, buildings afterwards. So actually, a lot of the buildings were adjusted quite easily with partitions moved or extended. Um, so actually, there's a sense of uh, uh, to some extent an ex uh, uh, an extent of continuous work or labour. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. One more question. Okay, I think uh, there will be, I'm sure there will be plenty of time to, to question uh, 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 your presentation. Ah, Maria, yes. Please. No, no, no. I just want to actually mention in the chat, there's an interesting discussion about the relationship of, between actually Walter Segal's work uh, and, uh, and Japanese techniques. That maybe might be, you know, I was also curious to hear actually his position on that. Um, yes, I um, I have in my research, I'm very much putting the influences in the footnotes and concentrating on the um, core works. I think there was, there were clearly, he was, uh, he considered Bruno Taut a uh, mentor. Um, and clearly there's a relationship between um, his timber frame structure and both um, Japanese construction and American balloon construction, which he was also um, very interested in. So there's a there's a kind of awareness that he's uh, that he had that he wasn't um, wholly inventing something here, that actually it had these strong relationships with um, existing cultures of buildings. Uh, and even suggested, I think, that Britain had a kind of dormant earlier kind of tradition. Great. And what about this question on regulations uh, that I think is also quite interesting because, of course, uh, you know, we know that policy actually uh, limits a lot our agency, uh, both as architects, but also as potential, you know, inhabitants building our own uh, houses. Yeah, he, um, he, uh, he was enormously frustrated by planning and building regulations, but at the same time, he also uh, engaged in with them in a, 
in, a, in an ongoing struggle. Um, the um, significantly the Lewisham houses he um, he did minimal elevations for the elevations he considered as um, a um, a kind of self self evident realization of the construction system and plan and um, it was only the uh, borough architect who had to draw the elevation for planning permission because his uh, Siegel's drawings weren't deemed uh, sufficient. So there was a kind of uh, frustration. Um, yeah, he re referred to planning and building control as the control apparatus, um, um, but a, a kind of engagement in the struggle. Thank you. There is uh, something uh, I, I found really interesting, uh, especially also in the way you presented this work, uh, uh, because often, I mean, we know the work of Walter Siegel through the, the buildings themselves, but you have showed actually quite a lot of drawings. And I, and it seems that drawing really was a, a still a tool for, for his way of, uh, of, of design. But of course, it's a, it's a very different kind of drawing that... Uh, 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 for example, something that really I found interesting is how he very, you know, he almost uh, uh, took uh, all this kind of managerial aesthetic of uh, tabulations and computations uh, almost as a very creative, as, as a side of creativity, not not simply as a way to, you know, to delegate the the the, the work to basically algorithms as as happens today, but uh, somehow he he took seriously also the kind of managerial aspect uh, of, of the project or the building components, but in a creative way, but transcending, in fact, the managerial character of, this, uh, of these documents. And I think it almost uh, builds up, uh, uh, in, in my opinion, a kind of interesting aesthetic, uh, I would say, almost, like uh, in its dryness uh, also. Absolutely, which relates to Katie's talk earlier of the this idea of the gatekeeper uh, the architect is gatekeeper to an existing world of building products. Mm. Um, certainly, in his in his earlier career, he 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 published in 1948 a um, a book, Home and Environment, about um, uh, building uh, house layouts, uh, settlement patterns, and so on, which is beautifully illustrated by himself. Um, but actually, towards these kind of later times, um, he seems to have taken a delight in. Um, in the drawings that clients would produce in having a um, slightly more ambiguous relationship with drawing. Mm. 